Hi guys, come on in. Welcome. Welcome. I'm so happy to have you guys here. Well, you're in for the full Kathy experience. I like to start every single class with a dance party. So I like to start with music. I think music is such a great way to raise our vibration, to change our state. So we're going to start with a song that I wrote, which if you listen to the podcast, you've heard it. I'm going to share the sound on my computer and we are going to listen to a song. If you feel like moving your body, this is the confidence code. This is going to be a workshop about what I believe are going to be some helpful ways for you to overcome, delete imposter syndrome. And one fun way is to just dive in and dance because it feels good. If you don't feel like dancing, you don't have to. But I say, why not? Why not? Why deny yourself something that makes your body feel more alive and feel good? We want to change our state. So I'm going to share the sound on my screen. So uh, this is called Heart of a Hero. And we're going to dance it out. And then we're going to get started right, right at the end of the song. times I chose to run So many times I held my tongue I held my tongue Never saying what I needed to Scared they walk away And I would lose Yeah, I would lose But now I'm back in here to fight Can't worry if I'll be light The game got old and I've had
true. It's so true. You do have the heart of a hero. How many of you, tell me what you thought about, tell me in the chat, type it into the chat. What did you think about hearing that song? Did you have a moment where you were like, you know what? This is true. I'm remembering what I forgot. This is true. Yeah. Yeah, you're alive. It's a good reminder. You're brave. Yeah. Yeah, I often say that um, your 11-year-old self is so proud of you because I don't have to know every person's specific story to know for a fact that if you're on the planet longer than a little while, you've survived a lot. Somebody passed away. Somebody broke your heart. Something happened and you survived. So here we are tonight. We're talking about how to crack the code on confidence. And I'm going to share a few things with you. Hopefully this is going to help. But I want to ask you to ask yourself, what did you come here to hear? What do you think? Close your eyes for a second. What permission do you need? What answer do you need? What words do you need to hear? Just curious what your higher self would say. I matter. I'm enough. Commitment. Yeah, I'm worthy. I'm proud. Breaking through fears. Yeah, so I feel like everybody has sort of a signature thing that they do. Seth Godin told me, he said, Kathy, you're a radical encourager. That's what you do. So I think everyone has like a bunch of gifts, but there's like one gift that's like their, that's their move, right? That's like the Michael Jordan move, right? Everyone's got like their move. So I think this is my move. And no matter how many times you you hear something, it's amazing how we can never hear it enough if that is the thing that we need, right? Like Adam Grant said to me, you don't have to say something new if you say something true. Because if if the thing you're working on in your life is commitment or self-worth or faith, um, then those are things we're going to rinse and repeat, right? And hopefully every time we hear them, we're in a new place and we keep building upon it. So whether you've been with me or this is your first time, I hope that you leave with something new. So what does this mean? What is the the whole deal with confidence? Well, what I think is interesting is that the biggest question that I hear people asking, it's not how do I build a business? It's not, what am I meant to do? I do hear that. But what I hear more is, who am I to do this? And I started hearing it so often that I thought, oh my gosh, this is definitely something we need to talk more about. I find it fascinating. Who am I to do this? Because my question to you is, who are you not to do this? Let's change the paradigm. It's interesting because so many characters throughout history, this is the hero's journey, right? How many times does Charlie Bucket like want to bow out of the whole the whole thing? He's going to let go of this golden ticket. Or like Moses, right? Let's go biblical. There's this burning bush and God appears to him and he's like, hey, I think you're the person. I have a mission for you. And he's like, no, 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 no. Like I'm not the person, right? Find somebody else. I have a lisp. I can barely speak. I'm not the person. They would never want to hear this from me, right? So so what is it that's going on here? I think that there's a a few pieces to it, and we're going to to go through it tonight, and hopefully we're going to change some energy. You know, we happen to think that the world is mostly material. We believe that the world is made up of physical, because that's what we can see, but we know that an atom is 99.999% energy. And 
0.0001% matter. And we know that we can, at this point, we can measure energy, right? And we know that energy has a lot to do with what actually gives momentum to things, to ideas, to nations, um, to our health, to our immune system. So it's interesting because what we do is we say, who am I to do this? And we have to define the I in the who am I. We tend to think that the I is this little I, this ego I, right? This, this character that we are playing, at least in this moment, right? This role that we play. I have freckles. I have reddish brown hair. Most of it now is actually gray. I have to dye it all the time. I have three little girls, so I'm a mother. Uh, I didn't wear my retainers, so I don't have like perfect teeth. I'm really bad at math, right? Like um, I'm not really athletic. I could never do the splits. Um, I have an okay singing voice, but I'm not the best. I have such and such amount of followers. I have such and such amount of people on my you know, email list. I have this much money in my bank. I have this much, I'm a size eight. I wish still that I was a size six, but after three kids, I'm not. How many of you define yourself that way? Type a one in the chat if you've ever thought of things like that that helped you define yourself. Yeah, so that's the physical world. That's the world that we've been indoctrinated into. So since you were born, there's a lot of messages all around where people start to put labels and judgments on you and everyone around you. And you start to categorize people. And these are the smart kids. And these kids are not in the advanced math. And those kids are rich. And these kids are spoiled. And those kids are not. And on and on and on, right? So part of imposter syndrome is we start comparisonitis, right? We, we look at people on Instagram and we're like, okay, well, her clothes look like this and her marriage looks like this and she has amazing avocado toast and I would never be able to put together a lunch like that for myself. And my husband and I haven't had even any sex in four years, let alone like wearing matching plaid outfits, right? How, how many of you have ever... Type a one in the chat if you've ever, oh no, you're like me, never. No, how many of you have ever compared yourself to someone on Instagram? I won't name names, but I literally have had times where I'm looking at an influencer or somebody who has a podcast and I look at them and their life and their marriage and I say to my husband, we are just hopeless. Look at this person, look what they're doing. And then 14 seconds later, that whole thing blows up and you're like, Oh my God, what was I even comparing myself to? Do you know what I'm talking about? So, so much imposter syndrome comes from, we take our narrative, our ego's story and compare it to other people's egos and their stories. And in that world, we are all trying to match up, right? We have to look at like, well, if that's what matters, then I don't have a PhD and she does. Well, I'm not in the seven figure club and she is. I only have two kids. She has four kids, right? Like whatever it is, I have a one car garage. She has a three car garage. I just don't feel I'm good enough. Who am I to help that person? Who am I to share my thoughts with this person? So yeah, I mean, I felt this way in seventh grade. I would walk into the lunchroom and immediately turn around, walk out, go to the office and ask the secretaries, if I could like just hang out there and eat my disgusting lunch, because my mom, for some reason was like against mayonnaise, like she couldn't put anything on bread. So it was like turkey and two pieces of bread. And I couldn't, my mouth would get so dry and then nothing, not a fruit roll up, not a note, just that. And like a green apple. And she'd want me to go buy milk, but I was like lactose intolerant. Lunch was awful, but I would sit in the secretary's area because I didn't feel cool enough to be in the lunchroom. And the coolest girls in school were really mean to me. In fact, I performed in the talent show. You guys now know, for some of you who didn't, I write music, I sing. And I had this talent, right? I was like a little kid, like a stick legs, like no chest, no nothing. And this big voice. And I sang, I was like the girl in the Pepsi commercial. Do you remember her? 
Um, I sang a song in seventh grade. I was like a Gloria Stefan song in the talent show and I won. And then everyone was mean to me after that. These like cool girls, they lost. So then they sent these notes around about me and everybody hated me and they made sure that I knew that they hated me. And so my life was miserable and I was very vulnerable. So I would like say things like, I just wish we could like be friends. Like, I'd love for you to like me. And like, those are like not cool things to say. So it wasn't until I went to high school that I actually started to have some friends because multiple middle schools fed into the high school. So there was a lot of people who didn't know that I was that girl in middle school and I could start to have friends again. Anyway, so I know what it's like. Um, I also have two parents who were really unhappy. Uh, my mom has always struggled with mental health and so is my dad. And my dad wound up taking medication for mental health and found some ways to cope. My mom never did. So I grew up with that. And then my parents split up and my dad really left and got married to someone else and forgot to tell my sister and I that he got married. But like he actually did get married and have a wedding and he had kids and just forgot to mention it. So we weren't in his life. And I'm sure as a little kid, that felt like a really big rejection. So there was rejection. There were people around me who were really miserable and didn't have a strong sense of self. And either did I. And when I was a kid, my mom really idolized famous people. So I used to think that unless you were the people she admired, like Judy Garland, unless you were famous like that, then you really were like a nothing. And so I used to think, well, one day I'm going to get out of this small little town and go to LA. I'm going to be famous. And then I'm going to be a somebody. So what's interesting is we create these egos. We play these roles. But is that really a good way of describing or defining who we are? Like if I made a list of the things that would define my waist size, my income, my height, my skin color, my religion, like and you took one of those things out and looked at it, would you really get who I am? I mean, really? What if you took three of those things and you're like, okay, she's, she has freckles, she's Jewish, she has a decent singing voice, and you just stopped with that. Would you have any real clue who I am? I don't think so. My friend Amy, one of my closest friends, Amy Purdy, she is a Paralympic snowboarder, three-time gold medalist. She doesn't have legs. But without her legs, is she still her? Maybe I would say she's even more than she was. What if somebody lost their heart and had a heart transplant. Would they be who, they're, who they are? I think so. I think there's a lot of people who've had to go through that. And I think it's not the heart, the physical heart at least, that makes them who they are, right? So what is imposter syndrome then? It's the imposter looking at the other imposters it's trying to win the race that you don't even want to win. You're not your waist size or your skin color or your math ability or your income, right? You are a soul. You are energy. When you were conceived, that sperm met that egg. What was it? electricity, life force, pure potential, right? Blank canvas, just with incredible, incredible energy, like a superpower Tesla charging station, right? That's what that is. That's us, right? So on my journey, I went seeking meaning and I was in college. I started out as a theater major, realized I was so depressed that I needed to, um, do something that was actually going to help me because I was feeling so sad. So I actually started reading a lot of books on philosophy and religion and 
I found out that I could get a degree in the humanities department if I wanted to, and I could read books and get credit for them. So I became a world religion major, which was, which was an amazing thing. Like I got, I got college credit to read books on Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Sikhism, Jainism. Like that was like a degree. It was amazing. And the best part is that the question that was always being asked is why are we here? And who am I fundamentally? And what's the point? And I was obsessed. And I loved that every single time you boiled down any of it, it was all the same. You're here to serve. You're here because you're part of something bigger than yourself. And there are many words to describe it, but you are energy, your soul. You are not a body. So that's cool because all of that was a through line. So I then went on to study more deeply mindfulness at the UCLA Mindfulness Awareness Research Center, which I loved. And I also studied mysticism, Kabbalah in Jerusalem for a couple of years. And I've just continued to study neuroscience and anything I can get my hands on that helps me understand the quantum physics and everything else. And it is all more of the same, which is the best. You are a masterpiece, a piece of the master. You're needed and you know it. And the reason why Netflix doesn't do it the reason why you can have all the good shows to watch and you can have the best sushi takeout and something still feels empty is because your favorite thing to do is serve and contribute. However, when the headline keeps being, who am I to do this? We have a problem. Do we not? Do you see the double bind? We are craving contribution. We are craving stepping into alignment with what we came to this planet to do. And at every turn, we are hearing, who are you to do that? And the discomfort is so strong that we distract ourselves. So we get busy doing some online shopping or making a Pinterest board or planning somebody's 50th birthday party or making our own masks during COVID. And... Sometimes we get distracted by coming up with lots of excuses for the reasons why we're upset, like my husband, or I don't love the way my room looks, or I need to move again, or whatever it is, when the real emptiness is, I know there's something I'm put here to do, and I don't do it. Why not? Well, I sometimes tell myself, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. So that gets in the way. But why don't I know what to do? Well, we're going to talk about it with these three parts of the confidence code. Well, I don't take enough action to figure out what I want to do. Why not? Because I don't want to be messy. Why not? Because I don't want to fail. Why not? Because I don't want to be criticized. Why not? Because I feel like a fraud. So we just keep staying in this loop. So I'm sure you've heard the Nelson Mandela quote. You know, it's not our weaknesses. It's not our smallness that we're afraid of. It's our bigness, right? Your bigness is what doesn't let you rest. You know how big you actually are. That's why it's not letting up, won't go away. That's a good thing in a way, right? So what then do we do? So I wanna talk about the three pieces to this and you were all sent a workbook and you can go through the workbook in your own time but I will share my screen in a little bit just to go over a couple of those pages but I don't think we need to spend the whole time going through the whole thing because you guys know how to read and you can do it on your own. But there are three pieces to what I think is the confidence code, okay? So we're gonna go over these three things. The practice, we'll talk about what that is. Taking messy action, we'll talk about that. And relationships. So what is the practice? The practice is every single day, when you get up, practicing coming home to the truth, which is, I am a soul. So I promise it's the 
craziest, weirdest thing. But even if you haven't meditated in forever, or you've been unaware of any of this stuff, it's always a breath away. This place inside of you that feels like your highest self, your truth, your center, your soul. Well, when you align with that every day before you start your day, that part of you isn't trying to compete. That part of you feels totally enough. If you feel in, if you close your eyes and you just put your hand on your heart, you take a deep breath and you find your center, find your center, find it. Take a couple deep breaths and find the you of you. That part of you feels connected to love, endless love, endless compassion, strength, wisdom, grace, kindness, expansion. Can you feel that? Now open your eyes. So that part of you, that's where you lead from. It's so easy to wake up, grab your phone, start checking your social media stuff, and you just get pulled right into the material world. And then as opposed to being a driver of your ship, you're just constantly responding to circumstances all day long, right? So we want to be practicing being anchored in that. And what I've found in my life that's amazing is I've had to do things that are sometimes intimidating where I start to get a little bit caught in that ego place. Like, oh, I have to interview Matthew McConaughey on Zoom tonight. Ooh, I start feeling small, right? I start thinking about his ego, his character, his persona, right? How famous he is, how handsome he is, how wealthy he is, how whatever else. And then I think about my story, my character and how much less it is in certain ways based on those quotients. And then I come back home to my soul and I say, oh, but soul to soul, it's, it's perfect. Let's just do this thing. Let's meet, let's hold presence, let's connect. And it works every time. The thing that people want most, it doesn't matter if it's Warren Buffett or the guy who sells apples at your grocery store, the thing that every person wants most is to feel seen and is to have the gift of presence from another person in their life. Real presence when somebody makes a space. Well, even Oprah needs that. When we meet in that state, when we have open-hearted coherence, when we're dropped in, when our mind is not spinning, when we're not trying to prove, when we're not working so hard to hustle for it and earn it, we're just present and we have an open heart, that is intoxicating. That, that is the only thing that is really powerful that if anyone wants to be intimidated by, that kind of love and vulnerability, that's to be admired. What does it matter if somebody's famous or has a billion dollar brand, if there's no integrity? So the practice is the most important thing. It's the knowing I've been assigned. When you do that, you step into this receptive mode, you step into this expansive mode, and you start to see yourself in such a magnificent way. It doesn't matter. For my friend Amy, it doesn't matter if she has legs or not. Not gonna slow her down. 
And for other people, it doesn't matter if they're big or tall or orange or green or it, none of none of it matters if they have the money or they don't have the money. It's like, what's what's with the heart? Where's that heart? Where's that open hearted vibration? And so that was always my little secret weapon is I would be asked to speak on stages in front of a thousand people, or I would have to sit down with, I remember when Howard Schultz came on the podcast, he was running for president of the United States and he created Starbucks and I had to sit down with him and I had, I had a Starbucks in my hand and I spilled it. Like I had gotten pulled into the vortex of like, this is a billionaire he's got this, I've got this, right? As opposed to like, we're energy. What's his energy really like today? Because if we're just playing with energy, I could play, right? I could hit the ball back and forth. And as soon as I spilled the coffee, it like woke me up and I was like, oh, you're just spinning. You're just in the imposter syndrome. So you're spilling the coffee, just come back. And so I just sat down and I opened my heart. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? I said, I just saw the way you spoke to your wife. He's been married to the same woman for over 40 years. I said, there's a story that God was going to create people. And the angel said, why would you do that? Why would you ruin this world? You already have angels. Don't make people. And God said, because people have free will. So that'll be neat to see if they can choose good. Because you can't, angels. You only do good. You can't do bad. And they said, don't do it. And he said, just watch what a person can become. And I said to Howard, I'm in awe of the way you spoke to your wife. And he started to cry. And he said, first of all, thank you. Second of all, how do you know that story? Third of all, where are you from? And he starts asking me about myself. And we start having this conversation. And he says, do you know that I grew up in public housing? Do you know that we used to get food dropped off from Jewish family services because we didn't have two nickels to rub together? Do you know that we lived at the last stop of the L train in Canarsie, Brooklyn, the last stop? And my mother used to say, this is the last stop of the L train. It is not your last stop. You don't get off here. He said, it's my mother. Because she let me know, don't you go buying into this. This is not your last stop. And he and I went on to have a conversation, which I thought was going to be about how to grow a business. It wound up being a conversation about humility and legacy. And at the end of it, he said, I've been doing so many interviews, Kathy. This is my favorite interview. I so appreciate the way you showed up today. And then he stayed in touch with me. And that story is basically the exact same story I have repeated every day, all day long with whoever I've met in its own way, whatever was of that moment, because I wake up from the dream of the ego and I say, I'm not in that dance. Let's connect. And every human being is hoping that somebody will show up that way. Do you know how sick and tired people who are famous, they're so sick and tired of yes men all around them. They can't stand it. It's like, I just want a real person to talk to about real things, right? Someone who's genuine, someone who's going to ask me a real question or actually care about me and what I'm about and see me, not see my wealth, not see whatever, see me. I've had the same conversations with people who had nothing. There is a homeless man who used to stand at the exact same place in front of the Rite Aid near where my fertility doctor was. And for six years, I went through 12 rounds of IVF, mostly unsuccessful and a bunch of miscarriages. And I used to go to the same fertility doctor's office over and over and over again. And I would always see him. And so I would always remember to have a dollar or two to give to him when I would go 
to the doctor. But he would stand there and he would tell every person who walked by, every person, it didn't matter if they were rich or poor or if they were in a group or they were by themselves, he would look at them and he would say, you're a miracle. Hey, miracle, you're a miracle. And he meant it. And one day I was walking fast because it was raining and I pulled out a $10 bill from my purse and I thought to myself, I'm like, you know, this is like, what, 10 years ago? And I'm like, should I give him 10 bucks? Oh, forget it. Just give him 10 bucks. Fine. Give him 10 bucks. So I hand him $10 and he goes, thank you. You're a miracle. And I quickly run inside the doctor's office and there's a glass um, wall so I can still see where he is. And about a minute after I had given him the $10 bill, there was another homeless man coming by on crutches. He handed him the $10. He goes, hey, brother, you're a miracle. And the guy looks at him, he goes, take it. You take it. And I broke, I broke into tears. I'm like, that's a person who's not identifying with anything other than their soul. Abundance mentality, kindness giving it away. I've told that story so many times. That one man who had no idea, who wasn't doing it for the glitz and the glamour, I have told so many people that story. He has affected so many people because to me, I was like, you know, $10 to me when I was 29 was not a big deal, but I, I thought about it for one second, but it wasn't a big deal. $10 to him could have been his whole day's pay or a week's worth, and he gave it away like that. We get really distracted, and we start to play this game. Do you have the new iPhone yet? Not yet? Oh, you should get it. Where are you guys going? Oh, well, we went on the VIP tour of that. Oh, cool. Now, can you have a lot and be awesome and kind? 100%. Look how many people, I mean, type a person in the chat, who you admire, who has helped build a hospital or is helping women in Africa or cares about the world. Oh yeah, Melinda Gates, Bill Gates, Oprah, Michelle Obama. Anybody else come to mind? There's thousands of people like that. Thank God, right? Their names are on the sides of all the kinds of museums and buildings and schools. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. But the part that's not good is identifying with this fake sense of what we actually are. I think about the people who've written books that I love. And it dawned on me over the last few years interviewing these people for the podcast. I was like, huh, I had Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell on. Malcolm Gladwell's not a psychologist? He's a journalist. He actually is a guy who was rejected from tons and tons of ad agencies. So he went into journalism as like a second career. And then he decided to get really curious about the way that humans behave and compiled lots of research. What would have happened if he would have said, well, who am I to do this? I don't have a degree in sociology. Well, that would be a big shame because there's uh, a few bestsellers that crossed every single record in the last few decades, his name is on those books. I then interviewed Gretchen Rubin and she wrote all these books on happiness and she has a podcast about it and she's known to talk about it. She doesn't have a degree in positive psychology. In fact, she self-identifies as somebody who is miserable. Who is she to talk about happiness? Why is she talking about it? Because for her, it wasn't look at me, it was come with me, right? Can you think of a person who is successful doing something right now who didn't have a degree? Can you think of a person who you admire who's successful in their life and they didn't have a degree in that topic? Dolly Parton, someone said. My father, my husband, Gabby Bernstein your dad, right? So we have to practice knowing the truth. 
And what we understand is that from the ages of zero to eight, we are in like theta state. So everything, those are like the days of wet cement, everything that goes in kind of gets stuck in there. And then you run that program for the rest of your life. Michael J. Fox, someone just said, right. Amazing human being. So we run a program every day. If we're not practicing what we really need to start wiring into our brain, it's called a paradigm shift. It's called connect to your soul. It's called, you don't have to win a race. You're not even trying to run. 